Hi guys, Miss Marie Sick here, and in this video, we're going to talk about how to calculate the formula of a hydrated ionic compound. Now, just as kind of a reminder about the basic format of a hydrated compound, you're going to have one formula unit of some sort of ionic compound, a dot, and then a certain number of waters kind of attached to it. Now, these waters aren't really bonded to the ionic, rather they're trapped within the lattice structure. As a reminder, ionics have kind of a regular repeating pattern of cations and anions, and what happens is that water molecules can kind of sneak their way into the empty spaces of the lattice structure. And so we end up with this ratio of one formula unit of the ionic versus a set number of waters. Now, to solve these problems, I really need two key pieces of information. I need to know how much of this ionic compound I have mass-wise. So I need to know the anhydrous portion of this, the without water portion. And then I also need to know how much water I drove off when I heated it up. So the goal of these labs is always to have this compound with both things that I'm starting off with. Heat it up, drive off all the water, get it to dry out, and then I can get the mass of the dry compound by itself. And by subtracting the dry compound and how much I started with, I can end up also getting the mass of the water that I need to do the calculation. Now these calculations look a whole lot like empirical formula. If you remember, those have the steps of percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by smallest, multiply to whole. And on those, what we were trying to do is find a ratio of one atom to another. Here it's a little bit different because I'm trying to find the ratio of one compound to another. So rather than dealing with individual elements, we'll be dealing with compounds. Um, and also you're never going to need the last multiply till whole step. The reason why is we always want this ionic compound to come out to be one. So I will warn you that sometimes, you know, lab data is not perfect. And so sometimes this doesn't come out cleanly to a whole number when you're actually doing this in lab. And so sometimes we just have to round to the nearest whole number when we're actually doing this. So let's kind of jump into a problem here. And these types of questions usually describe a lab data process that's occurring. So you notice here they ha said, hey, we're using this sodium thiosulfate, and we're starting with 16.59 grams of hydrated, meaning with its water, sodium thiosulfate. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of start jotting down information here. I always like to do that to kind of organize my thoughts. So I have Na2S2O3 with some amount of waters present. So I'm going to put X number of waters and figuring out what that X is is going to be our goal. And they have told us that of this whole compound, I'm starting off with 16.59 grams. Okay. So then what they're going to do is they're going to heat this up. And you notice they mentioned that they heat it through several cycles. And what they do is at the end of each heating cycle, they'll mass it. And what they're trying to do is by doing this several times, they're trying to make sure that all that water has been driven off. Okay, so it says we want to reach a consistent mass that would ensure that as much water as possible had been evaporated off. So then it says the dry sample after the final two cycles has a mass of 10.59 grams of anhydrous, meaning without water, sodium thiosulfate. So this portion of my compound here is going to be 10.59 grams. All right, so now it says, hey, what's the formula for the original hydrate. So the first thing I would want to do is figure out what mass of water was in this compound. I need a mass ratio of the anhydrous to the water part. Well, if the whole thing was 16.59 and I see that this dry part of the compound here is only 10.59, I know I can subtract those and get the value of just the water. So again, to get the water, and you want to always show your work here, so I'm going to show that, hey, to get that value, I would take the 16.59 subtract off the 10.59. And since I'm doing a subtraction, I would want to address places past the decimal here, okay? So both of those had two places past the decimal, so that means I would want to show 6.00 grams of water that I had. All right, so now that I have my mass ratios here, now I can go through the same steps like I would with an empirical formula. Now on empirical formula, Normally I would do percent to mass first. Well, I already have mass ratios here. So the next step is mass to mole. Normally I would do that for two individual elements. 
Here I'm doing it for these two compounds. So I'm going to have the Na2S2O3. Then I'm starting off with 10.59 grams of it. And I'm going to have the H2O. Then I'm starting off with 6.00 grams of it. And what I want to do is I want to do a mass to mole step. As a reminder, to go between mass and moles, I would use the molar mass. So I would need to figure out my molar mass of Na2S203. Now I'm going to cheat because I already know the molar mass of it. I calculated it earlier. It has a molar mass of 158.10. For every one mole. And again, just like before, I would want to show at least four sig figs here. So that gets an answer of 0 0.06698. And on the water, I know water has a molar mass of 18.02. That's one we're pretty familiar with for every one mole of water. And again, I would want to show at least four sig figs here, if not more, because I'm not done with my math yet. So this gets an answer of 0 0.33296. All right, so did the mass to mole step. Next step in the saying is divide by the smallest. Now, what you should see is that the ionic compound should always have the smallest number. The reason why is because I'm going to be able to divide by it and ensure that that comes out to be 1. I want the coefficient in front of the Na2S203 to be 1. I want one of that substance right there, and I want to figure out how many waters go along with it. So when I do that, I'm going to plug in this data here and kind of show you what it comes out to be in the calculator. Now, I will say this on problems that you're given, um, say, on a test or a quiz or something like that, you're probably going to have pretty clean data where it's going to come out really close to a whole number. came out to 4.97. So obviously, I could round that to 5. Okay. However, I will warn you that when you're actually doing this in lab, depending on the success of your lab, that may or may not come out to a perfect whole number. However, you never, ever, ever want to multiply to whole on these problems because remember, what I do to one number, I would also have to do to the other one. And I don't want to change that ionic compound from being one of it. Okay, I always want that to stay one. So we, on these, we round this number to the closest whole number. All right, so what that means is that my compound is Na2S2O3 with five waters. And if I was going to name this, what I would do is I would use the sodium thiosulfate part of the name that they already gave me. And then the prefix for five is penta. And then I put hydrate after it. So there would be the name of the compound, sodium thiosulfate pentahydrate, and you can see our formula right there. Now, uh, these types of lab questions usually have some data analysis kind of questions with it. It's very common to see these types of uh, questions on the AP test. So let's kind of look and see what kind of lab questions they ask us about. It says, hey, in the example above, the sample went through multiple cycles of heating. And it asks again, why was it important to do multiple cycles of heating? And again, what we're trying to ensure is that the compound is truly dry. That all the water is vaporized. We're trying to make sure that all of that water has been completely driven off. So then it says, hey, why did a consistent mass need to be reached? Well, it's kind of the same thing as above. If I'm doing this multiple times, okay, and I'm ensuring that every time I'm heating it and letting it cool and massing it out, if I'm ensuring that that mass that I'm getting is staying constant, then again, that means that no more water is being lost. And if no more water is being lost, then that means my compound is truly dry. 
and that all the waters are gone. Yay! Which is the whole point. If there were water still remaining in there, then that poses a problem. And that's where our next part of our question asks us here. It says, hey, what kind of numerical error in our final formula could have occurred if the sample was not totally dry? Well, let's go back and think about this for a minute in the context of our data. We would have had this number to start off with regardless of if we dried it out or not. Okay, so that 16.59 would not have changed. However, if I didn't get rid of all of the waters, what that would mean is this anhydrous mass would be too big because it would have still had some waters in there as well. Okay. Well, if that number was too big, then when I subtract it off, what that would mean is that the water mass would look too small. So if the water mass is too small, then think about what that would do. When I get to these calculations here, if this number is too small, then our number of moles ends up too small. Not only that, but then this moles of the Na2SO is 203 would have been too big. So when I divide that too small number by the too big number, I end up with the number of waters that is smaller than what I was anticipating. So that means the number of waters is too low. And so that's a very common error that we see on this particular lab. Most of the time, your number of waters is too low versus too high because it wasn't totally dry even though we thought it was. So I will tell you that very often on labs that involve hydrate problems, if you come out off, but you come out kind of in between um, two waters, like let's say your data came out between four and five, I usually tell people to round up to five because it's more likely that your number of waters was too low. That's again a very, very common error there. Um, hopefully this all rings a bell. I know we did something similar to this in pre-EP. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.